Yes, 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 yes. Welcome, welcome, welcome into episode two of Buzzer Beater Banter. I am your host. Mr. Lennon Burton coming in for episode two. Sorry it came a little late. Last night when I was getting everything ready, recording, we had some technical difficulties. Plus, I had to finish the Pelicans game. And yeah, so you got it a little later today, but don't worry. Uh, Tomorrow's episode will be out early. That is ready to go now, so no stress. But today we have a very special episode. We have Jake Madison of the Locked On Pelicans come and talk all things Pelicans on the buzzer beater banter but before we get into that i have to talk because me and jake recorded it uh before the game yesterday and the pelicans won their matchup with the kings to send them to las vegas yes to send them to las vegas in the semifinal of the um of the what you call the tournament so basically if they win that game they go to the finals to play the uh, team from the east but they beat the Kings. This is the third time this season. The Pelicans have their number. The Pelicans won 127 to 117. Brandon Ingram had 30 points, six assists, and eight rebounds. Zion Williamson, 10 points, six assists, six rebounds. We'll get to him in a second. Jonas Valanciunas, 18 points, 11 rebounds. CJ McCollum, 17 points, seven rebounds. Herb Jones, 23 points, five assists, five rebounds. Trey Murphy, 16 points off the bench, one assist, two rebounds. And Jose Alvarado, uh, nine points, Najee Marshall, four. This game, the Pelicans started off slow. Brandon Ingram couldn't make a shot. Zion couldn't buy a bucket. Jose and Trey, Mur- um, Jose, Trey Murphy and Najee come into the game and they make a di- big difference, specifically uh, Najee and, her- and uh, Jose Alvarado. Herb Jones makes a shot off of a free throw that gets us back, ties it up, and then after that, the game's pretty much off and running and Brandon, uh, CJ, and Herb and Trey really take over and win this game for us. Let's talk about Herb really quickly. Herb was the person who impressed me the most yesterday. Not only is Herb Jones an incredible defender, I mean, the way the Pelicans get deflections, the length of this team, you see what Trajan Landing and David Griffin were building. Everybody last year, two years ago, wanted to give them so much flack. Well, now the disrespect, I mean, excuse me, you want the praise to be as loud as the disrespect was. And we disrespected them loudly. Trajan Langdon and David Griffin, bravo. We see what y'all were building around Zion and Brandon, a team that can defend, a team that has length, a team that can force turnovers and get the ball moving fast up and down the court. And Herb Jones is essential to that. But you got to give Herb credit because he improved his offensive game tremendously. The play that I think of is Herb taking the ball down the court and just dunking on the whole Kings team. Or when Zion Williamson drove in to the goal, um, drove into the paint, excuse me, attracted defense, kicks it out, Herb knocks down the tray. Or when Zion Williamson comes in, does the same thing, Herb makes the extra pass to Trey Murphy, knocks down the tray. This team is built to play around each other. Me and Jake kind of get into that. Now, um, Brandon Ingram, phenomenal. This guy is a great player for this team. He is the franchise with him and Zion. Him and Zion or the dynamic are the dynamic duo. Brandon Ingram, if he gets to the spot and pulls up, it's money. It is cash. And when he is on fire, he's on fire. What we need Brandon to do is to take more three-pointers and feel confident about it. If he does that, sky's the limit for that guy. CJ's back. It just looks better having that guy there, another consistent scorer. But Jonas Valanciunas, the way that the Pelicans are using him this year is how I always I always wanted and Jonas was battling in the paint. So Bonus couldn't ha- handle some of that pressure that Jonas was giving them. And like I said, defensively, Dyson, Naji, Jose, Trey, Herb, even Brandon, the length of them forces so many deflections and steals. Now, Zion had 10.666 rebounds. People were getting on him, talking about he's out of shape, he's this, he's that. Zion Williamson before this was putting up 24 points, 30 points, like, I'm not with the whole Zion is out of shape. Is Zion in the best shape that he could be in? No, but he'll get there because I remember Coach Krzyzewski saying it's the only way Zion Williamson gets in the shape is by playing actual basketball. And I think he is he in peak basketball shape. No, but is he out of shape? No, he's in decent shape right now. He will be in better shape 
by January. Is it something to rag on him about? Mm, maybe, but I don't think he was just, oh, let me slack, let me eat, let me do this. I don't think it's what Charles Barkley was making it out to be. And I think Zion will come and play better in the next couple of games. I think the in-season tournament is so important because this gives teams uh, an opportunity to have meaningful moments in meaningful games so they know how to overcome this. This was Zion's first meaningful game. He put up 10.6 rebounds, six assists. He's going to learn when games are meaningful and teams zero in on you, you have to figure another way to score. You have to figure a way to make yourself effective. And Mike Brown was saying, we're not letting Zion beat us this game. Everybody else stepped up. Mike Brown realized last game, Double teaming Zion didn't work. Zion still scored. So he figured a way to lock in on Zion and neutralize him. And it kind of worked. But that's what you need. So Zion, when it's the playoffs, he can come and do better. So that's why this in-season tournament is so important. And I want to see Zion in the next game against the Suns of the Lakers. And I expect him to have a big game. I, I do. The Pelicans have a shot at winning this which would propel them to having a great end of the regular season. This is huge. So that was a great, great performance we saw from the team. We need Zion to step it up. We'll talk more about the Pelicans as we continue on later this week. But without further ado, let's get into the interview with Jake Madison. Hello, Triple B Nation. Look, I'm excited. First interview of the new show. Had to bring in my guy because we have to talk Pelicans. We got Jake Madison of Locked On Pelicans joining the show. How you doing, Jake? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, man. Happy to be on here talking with you. Yeah, excited to be talking with you as well. It Funny enough, I feel like the Pelicans have already gone through three waves of like emotions as fans this season. And it hasn't even really kicked off. Like at first we were like, eh, should we be excited about this team? Then we kind of got excited about them. They were doing well. And then more injuries came and it's like, Oh no, is the sky falling? Now we're in the in season tournament potentially could win it. We still will see uh, by the time you guys are hearing this record Monday before the game, we could potentially win it depending on tonight. How do you feel about this team so far? It feel, Like I said, it feels like we've had three lives already this season. Are you in a positive place with the team right now? Yeah, I'd say I definitely am. And I, I, I have been all season long, even with the five game losing streak that they had, you know, and I think the way the kind of roller coaster they've had at the beginning of the year shows you've got to, you got to take a long view when it comes to the season, right. And not necessarily overreact to small sample sizes of three games, four games, five games. Like you're looking at, you know, kind of building things around 10 games or so because they got off to that four and one start a five game losing streak. And since then they've been seven and four and look really good during that seven and four stretch. They have a top 10 offense, a top 10 defense. They've been good during that period of time. And it just kind of shows you this team when healthy can compete with anybody, you know, they beat the Denver nuggets. They beat the Dallas Mavericks. Mavericks. They beat the Sacramento Kings. They were two points away from beating the Minnesota Timberwolves without Zion Williamson. The time those were the top four teams in the Western Conference. So they can really compete with any other team out there. And it just took them getting healthy and figuring some things out. You know, on that five game losing streak, Zion wasn't playing particularly well. Brandon Ingram wasn't playing particularly well. And as those guys started to kind of coexist a little bit more, figure some things out, they got good. You know, when your stars are playing better, you're going to win games. And now that they're getting healthy, CJ McCollum back, Trey Murphy back, you know, that's when you'll start to see this team really take off. And I think we're starting to hit that point right now with the Pelicans. So it's, there's definitely reasons to be very optimistic when it comes to the franchise at the moment. And you, and you nailed it. Cause for me, it's like these two guys haven't really played that many games together. So like the chemistry needed to be built and it's probably still not even a hundred percent there right now. But to your point, we are slowly growing there. We're slowly getting there. And then you add CJ, you add Trey Zion's gravity is affecting so much on the floor. When you see Jordan Hawkins getting wide open three CJ Trey, it's just Matt Ryan. When he comes back, this team could be very special. If you have to say right now, where do you see the weakness of this team at? There's a couple of areas. You know, I think one of the weaknesses, which will get sorted out with CJ and Trey back, you just kind of mentioned it, right? Like three-point shooting has not been good for them this season. If you look at a couple of their recent games against the second game against the Kings, 
the in-season tournament game against Los Angeles Clippers, you know, they were up big in both of those and allowed the opponent to get back in it. And the opponent was doing it with three point shooting and the Pelicans were making twos. So you're trading threes for twos, which means they're going to slowly creep back in there because the Pelicans still aren't taking probably as many three pointers as they need to take. CJ and Trey kind of fix that. I think, you know, Matt Ryan will kind of fix that too, though. I don't think he'll get as many minutes now that Trey Murphy's back, but in the one game, you know, when we're recording this, that Trey's played, he went four of 10. Yeah. Zion assisted on three of those four made threes, by the way, like that's a significant number there and shows you that that area I think is going to get fixed. You know, there are a couple of defensive issues. I think they need to clean up defensive rebounding has been better than it was to start the year, but I wouldn't call it good by any stretch. They need to end those possessions, not give up second chance points. Like they have, you know, at a higher rate than you would have liked this season. Sometimes they're just kind of like standing around ball watching, not really kind of playing their game. They can figure all that out. I think they're going to be fine. The, offense has been good particularly with everyone being healthy zion's back to his usual self like again you're seeing there's there's a good team here if there's one area they really need to look to address it's kind of the backup big man spot backup center spot with larry nance jr out right now you're relying on cody zeller zeller has played actually like shockingly well played bad, can, man. <laughs> man, they, look you gotta love a balding white guy on an nba court here that's like significantly younger than me too which makes me feel all sorts of ways and you know, but I don't know if you want to rely on that all season long to give you significant minutes. Nance hasn't been good even when he was playing, though he hasn't been like fully healthy in a significant time. So if they're if they want to go a little bit further, they need to get better minutes at that backup big man spot. That's something you can address at the trade deadline that doesn't necessarily need to be like a huge, huge piece, just some nice depth there. I think that would go a long way towards shoring things up. Now, and you brought up a very interesting point in this is something that I see when I when after watching games and I look at the box score, it's like, yeah, that's where they killed us. To your point, team rebounding. And I know I've heard critics say because Zion Williamson plays the traditional power forward, why does he not get as many defensive rebounds? Do you think that's an issue that he can fix? Or do you think this is just a team that has to team rebound? Because that that's literally how I looked at it uh, going into the season was like, the whole team has to block out. Otherwise, we're not going to really get boards because Jonas isn't necessarily the most athletic big. It would help more if we team rebound. I thought maybe Zion would have been better than he has shown this season at that. But how do you feel about, like you, you were discussing the rebounding thing, do you feel we're more of a team rebounding team? Or can, you know, two guys step up and or maybe play better and, and get more rebounds? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm i not overly concerned with his, like, rebounding issues or anything like that, right? Like, you know, Zion's undersized for power forward. He's 6'6". That's what he's listed at. You know, he's not the tallest guy. He's not necessarily going to be fighting for those defensive boards. as a guy who's 6'8", 6'9", in a more traditional size, like, lengthwise, height-wise of a power forward. So he's limited there a little bit, right? He does a very good job on the offensive glass, timing his second jump, and he's so quick. But it doesn't necessarily translate on the defensive side of the ball. You know, they're 17th in defensive rebounding this year. It's not a good number. It's not the end of the world. But Zion hasn't ever been a good defensive rebounder, right? And last year, they were the sixth best defensive rebounding team. The year before that, under Willie Green, I believe they were pretty good, too. What were they? Seventh best. So this is something that has kind of been a hallmark of this team as long as Zion's been on it. So it's a little surprising to see them struggle in this regard. Um, and so hopefully they're... They're going to be able to figure it out. And I think they probably will figure it out. So I think they're going to end up being okay with all of this. They just need to do it as a team. It's really as simple as that. 100%. Now, let me ask you, who has been outside of Zion and Brandon Ingram? Because we know at the end of the day, our duo has to show up for us to win games. But this team, Jake, I think they, we might be one of the deepest teams in the NBA outside of Zion and Brandon Ingram. Who has impressed you the most so far this season and why? There's a couple of guys. I, I So I push back on their super deep. Like, I don't know if they actually are at tops, right? We've okay. definitely seen some limitations here. I had someone at a watch party ask me the other day, like, are we too deep? And it's like, no, <laughs> they're definitely okay, not so, too, too deep. See, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say we're too deep. So why don't you um think, where, yeah. where would you think our lack of depth is at? So yeah. I, it's it's not that the depth is bad, right? It's just there's there's limitations to a lot of the guys that they play, I think. You know, Fair. you look at a guy like Jose Alvarado and there's limitations there. He's a useful player in limited minutes, but if he was playing 36 minutes per game as your starting point guard, I think you could run into some trouble there. 
right for sure. Not offense, and undersized point, on defense. Mm-hmm. Specific scenarios for him as well. That's yeah, fair. exactly. You know, you you have Larry Nance Jr., but those minutes haven't been particularly good with him out there, right? Najee can be very, very hit or miss. Um, Dyson Daniels does a lot of things well, but is he carrying any sort of offensive load? No. You know, Hawkins is is outperforming, but he's not great defensively. So there's limitations to all of those guys, which there should be, right? They're they're bent, they're not starting for a yeah, reason. That's players. not a knock on them necessarily, right? Like, you know, they they're doing what they do, but it's not like we have a team here of a second unit that would start on most teams and things like that. I think they're very yeah. useful players, right? And it works around the stars, and that's more important with that. But if you need to rely on Dyson Daniels to win you the game by scoring, this team's probably going to lose if that's the case, at least right now. It doesn't mean those guys can't develop. So I think there are some nice pieces here, but I'm not going to want to rely on any of them, right? When you look at this team, do they have a guy, compare it to say the Sacramento Kings with Malik Monk coming off the bench and being a go-to scorer for him. The New Orleans doesn't have a guy like that right now. They don't need a guy like that necessarily, but they don't have that sort of player. So that's why I push back on some of the depth here, right? Matt Ryan is on a two-way contract for a reason. He's been a nice piece. He's done some things, but defensively he's been bad and I don't expect him to get a ton of minutes now that Trey Murphy's back. So that's where I look at some of the depth here. I go, hold off. Just because guys are outperforming doesn't mean they're going to do it over the course of the season. That said, there's a couple of guys that I think have been really good, right? Like Jordan Hawkins is impressed for a rookie. He comes in, he's shooting the ball well, he's fearless. He plays bigger than he is. We knew the three-point shot was going to be there, but he's rebounding pretty well. He's got some ups and can score at the rim too. He hasn't been atrocious defensively all season more recently, but that's a rookie kind of going through it, but he looks like he's going to develop nicely. You know, I think you look at Dyson Daniels with the defense and with him in the starting lineup where there's been no shooting, he still managed to contribute and play relatively well with all of that. Uh, And then you have Herb Jones, who's kind of found an offensive game, much more of an offensive role. He's really impressed me this season, getting that big contract this off season, I think has maybe just taken some of the pressure off him to go out and just kind of do his thing. He's cutting, he's getting to the rim more than he has. He, He's taking three pointers, knowing that he's not a great three point shooter, but he's taking them in better volume than he has in the past. So taking more of them. And I think that's important too. And he's starting to hit them a little bit more. So as you look at some of these guys, they are playing pretty well, I think, you know, and they're working well around the stars. And that's the biggest thing. See, okay. Out there, I definitely want to go back to the depth, but because you did the herb one just now, I'm going to stay there right now. Herb phenomenal, man, really phenomenal. And, arguably one of the best defenders in the league. You have Dyson. They have sort of this Bash Bros things going on right now. Some some Hook, Canseco, and Giambi on the defensive side of the ball really shutting people down. I like what I've seen from her, but to your point, it's the offensive game that's really brought him to the next level and him cutting, him getting to the rim, and then knocking down shots when they need him and Dyson doing the small things. I, Dyson and Herb have been my favorite. In the depth thing, I I, I like how you mentioned it. I definitely think this team is built for Zion and B.I. when they're healthy. It's like almost like a a, a great meal where every part plays a a, a role and you're not outside of like the main course. But, you know, you still like the side. And I think the Malik Monk point is very, very, um, very prudent for when if they're trying to go farther in the uh, playoffs. Do you think they need a guy like that off the bench, a veteran guy just to have for those moments? No, like, I, I don't think so, right? Like, I think when you look at s- this team a little bit, they kind of, you know, ever I've seen people kind of scream, we need a score off the bench or something like that. Like, they don't, though. You know, when they're healthy, when you, you know, I think people forget that there's a rotation to your lineups, right? You're rarely running five bench guys out on the court at the same time, unless it's like a blowout either way. And you just don't need your starters to risk getting hurt. Otherwise you're going to kind of thread everyone in and out. It's called a rotation for a reason, not a wholesale lineup change or line change like you do in hockey. Right? So you're going to have one of Brandon Ingram, Zion Williamson or CJ McCollum on the court at all times. And you've seen CJ, at least in the beginning of the season before, for the injury kind of fill almost like a six man role. They were running him with a bunch of bench guys and Jonas Valanciunas and it was working. They had him, well, <laughs> yeah, Matt Ryan, Jordan Hawkins, Herb Jones or Dyson Daniels and Jonas Valanciunas out there. And it was basically CJ and like the bench mob, right? A bunch of shooters and a big man and a defender out there. And that worked and it allowed CJ to kind of run that second unit. He has space to drive into the lane. He can take the shots from three that he wants to take. So it's essentially using him as kind of like a 
six man scoring guy off the bench while he's still starting with the team being one of the first guys subbed out and things like that. So when you have three stars like that, you can do things like that. You know, if you have two guys, say the Sacramento Kings with Sabonis, with De'Aaron Fox, right? You can't necessarily. So you need you know, Malik Monk off the bench to do something like that. But the Pelicans with three guys that can go and get you 30 on any given night, it allows them to not necessarily need kind of that, that scoring guard or scoring guy off the bench. I think nearly as much because you can run Zion with a second unit, you know, you can run BI with a second unit around him and that allows you to get kind of the best of both worlds with everything. And I mean, if we want to get to the point where we think this team can go, Jake, all the good teams, they stagger their players. You have the Jason Tatums with their bench mob. You have the Jalen Browns. These guys, Zion and Brandon Ingram, are going to have to be able to lead some of these secondary units for us to really get to where we want to go. Because when we're playing at our best, to your point, the rotations are moving smoothly. How do you feel Willie's doing in in, in this year? Um, having Borrego kind of helping with the offense, I feel like he seems, I don't want to say more in control because I don't want to make it seem like I don't think he wasn't in control, but he maybe seems more sure of himself personally as a coach now. At least that's what it seems. Yeah, I'd say so. You know, I think he's been good this year. You know, it's the it's the head coach and he's always going to get, you know, a lot of flack when it comes to everything, right? But I think he's been overall good, you know, bringing in Borrego to kind of recharge the offense a little bit. I think his worked you know one of the things when you when you look at this is they're using Jonas Valanciunas much better you know I don't know if you necessarily need to trade him now when there was questions about his kind of long-term fit or even his fit this season with the team and they're using him in really creative ways and I've liked it again that first game against the Sacramento Kings where they won by like 40 points right you know you heard after the game their head coach the Kings head coach Mike Brown saying like we wanted to double Zion and we just weren't able to do it and it's because they were running Zion off of dribble handoffs with Jonas Valanciunas. Valanciunas would have the ball he just sticks his arm out Zion comes and takes it and curls around that big body which is creating space and now he's moving downhill and can score at the rim and you can't double team him when he's got a full head of steam like that you're just going to foul him and send him to the line and allow Zion to just pop off in that game and let the Pelicans just completely dominate the Kings for a mobile for a non-mobile big man that doesn't really do what you want him to do and doesn't space the court that was pretty effective and you've seen them do that a lot and there have been a couple of games where a guy like Jonas Valanciunas has had four five six assists I think this season and it's because they're using him in really really smart ways you know you're seeing a lot of action between Zion Williamson and Jordan Hawkins so pairing him with a shooter running pick and roll situations where Zion's got the ball and then you have Jordan Hawkins screening for him they did this a lot with JJ Redick too they're using it with Hawkins now those are just kind of smart things that we haven't seen a ton of from this team in the past so Willie Green kind of trusting his assistants being allowed to bring in the coaches that he wanted to bring in this year he inherited most of the assistant coaches in the past sure. bringing in kind of like his people I think has given him just a, I don't know like more trust in the team a little more faith something like that right and I think it's paying off he still has these guys playing really hard you know after Zion Williamson's comments of like I've been taking a back seat I don't know if I like this the stuff from a, you know a couple weeks ago it didn't feel like the team was ever lost or anything like that and they play hard for Willie Green on a nightly basis and I think that's what you really look for when it comes to a head coach 100% couldn't agree with you more now do you feel speaking of Zion Williamson we haven't talked much about him or Brandon Ingram how do you feel they have progressed as the franchise guys of this team are you satisfied with what they have done so far granted it's I mean man it's still December they need to be doing it in April and March for us to really you know see some some change but so far are you impressed with them yeah, look, they'd be good. They'd be good. There's still a, there's more of a clunky fit this year than there has been in the past. I'm willing to say that, but they're still good players and the team's winning games. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing, right? Like win your minutes, win games, go to the playoffs, win in the playoffs. Like simple as that. That's the end goal here for everything. You know, can these two win a title together? Depends. I think there's a possibility for that, but I wouldn't look at it and go like absolutely 1000% because of the lack of three point shooting. And we've seen that be a big problem for the Pelicans. You know, they were second to last third to last in the league last year at 30 attempts per game. They're not really above that at all this season. They might even be below that at this point. They're basically at the same number as last year. It was like 30.1, three point attempts per game. They're at 30.7. That number needs to go up. You're not going to get that from Zion Williamson because he's best scoring at the rim. Brandon Ingram likes that mid range shot and has been reluctant to shoot three. So if you have your two stars who use the majority of your possessions in neither are shooters 
that worries me a little bit long term when you just look at the landscape of the NBA in 2023 going into 2024. But if you can make up for that with CJ, with Trey Murphy, with Jordan Hawkins, there's a way to do this. And that's why I want to see how the rest of the season is going to play out. And if you do get enough three point shooting to just really unlock things for Zion, for BI, or to simply make teams pay for double teaming those guys, you'll be fine. And so, you know, the offense has been working. I think it's at times a little, not smoke and mirrors per se, but a little bit luck. You know, when you looked at the starting lineup they were running, which will go away now that CJ is back of Dyson Daniels, Herb, Zion, B.I., Valanciunas, there's no shooting in there. That lineup yeah. for like four or five games didn't take one corner three-point attempt. You won't win games if that's not the stuff that you're doing. So I think they still need to figure that out. Spacing has been clunky. If they are able to figure that out, then yeah, you're going to be okay. Because those are two really good scores. Yeah, for sure. 100%. Now, let me ask you, and this will be kind of us wrapping it up. I know you also host Locked on NBA at times. The Western Conference to me is, I, if some of these young teams can keep up the play, the Western Conference is deeper, arguably, than it's ever been with the Thunder emerging. You have the Timberwolves really there. The Kings are back. I mean, people would say the Pelicans somewhere in that mix of young teams that are good. Of course, the defending champs. How do you feel about the Western Conference as a whole? And who do you think are some of the, the teams that, you know, Pelicans fans should be worried about when it comes to the future of this team making the playoffs? Yeah, look, it's competitive and these teams are beating up on each other, right? You, you mentioned, you know, if you look at it, we can just kind of run it down. Like, I think Minnesota is very legit this year. You have Rudy Gobert looking like Rudy Gobert and being in the running for defensive player of the year. Anthony Edwards clearly has taken a leap this season yep. after his run with Team USA. And he is a legit superstar that could go out and give you 50 on any given night. They have enough complimentary pieces around them that that team looks to be very good and will continue to be very good, right? Like, okay, see, I saw this one coming a mile away. You know, when you looked at how they played at the end of last season, beating the Pelicans in the playing tournament in New Orleans, Shea Gilgis Alexander, again, a go-to score that shoots threes. When you can build a team around a guy like that with a bunch of other complimentary pieces, getting Chet Holmgren uh, this season and a couple of others, like they've done a very good job there. Denver's still Denver with Nikola Jokic. The Kings are rounding into form, though New Orleans seems to be a very bad matchup for them. Phoenix is Phoenix. Phoenix. Yep. Dallas has been playing well behind Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving. Like, all of these teams are good. Then you get to the Lakers and the Pelicans in the 7th and 8th spot. Behind them are the Clippers, who we know are going to figure it out because there's enough talent there. The Golden State Warriors are 9 and 11, but we know what they're capable of doing. There's just no teams that are, like, outright bad in the Western Conference outside of the Spurs and Portland. Memphis is 5 and 14, but they don't have John Morant. They've been dealing with injuries. Yeah. Who knows what the rest of their season will look like. Houston's going to be a pesky team all all year long. I don't think they'll make the playoffs, but they beat New Orleans. So they're an annoying out. Like it's just brutal there. It's fun to see. And it just means that like, it's if, if whoever comes out of the West is going to be like battle tested, right? This is also going to be one of those things where you go into the postseason. You might be the lower seed, but feeling really good about your chances to win this because maybe your record doesn't reflect actually how good you are because these teams are all beating up on each other. 100%. And to your point, when you have pesky teams like Houston, Ime Adoka won't let them take a night off. That that nope. shows how much they're beating up each other. Chet's proving to be the real deal. When I saw Chet hit that shot against Golden State, I was like, okay, they might have two guys that are legit <laughs> with Shea and Chet. But thank you so much, Jake. Tell the people where they can follow you at on social media and tell them where they can get your amazing podcast at. Yeah, of course. I'm on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. It's at Nola Jake. You can find the Locked On Pelicans podcast. It's there Monday through Friday daily. Wherever you get your podcast, also on YouTube, just search Locked On Pelicans. Then we also got the Locked On NBA podcast that I do on Wednesdays, where we cover just the league as a whole. Same thing. Just search Locked On NBA, search Locked On Pelicans. You'll find it. We're everywhere. Heck yeah. Make sure y'all go follow Jake and uh, make sure you check out all of his amazing work. All right, with that being said, we'll finish up. I guess I'm calling these like the mini episode days. We'll finish that up right now uh, here. Want to say thank you to my guy, Jake, for coming on the show. Truly, truly appreciate it. Um, make sure you go follow him. Follow Locked On Pelicans. Remember, buzzer beater banter every day, giving you sports content. Uh, Smoke and myself Mondays and Fridays, but throughout the week, we have different guests. And the third uh, episode's guest, tomorrow, Wednesday's guest, Mr. Norman Locke coming on the show to talk all things college football and NFL. So be on the lookout for that. But for Jake Madison, my name is Lennon. You guys have a good one and peace.